Hello. Thank you everyone for coming on uh, to this webinar. We have over 300 people registered and the numbers are going up as we uh, are speaking. My name is Sandra Creamer. I'm the CEO of the National Aboriginal Women's Alliance, as well as an adjunct professor in public health for Queensland University. Today on the panel, we have frontline Indigenous women who are doing good work in communities and around the world. They will be sharing their wisdom and experience with us. Before I get started, I'd like to acknowledge the land we are on, the Drumble land I am on, and I'd like to thank you all for being here today as well as giving thanks to Nina Hall from the University of Queensland, who has helped me put this together, Phil from the University of Queensland for setting up the webinar, as well as staff, staff from Natsua. I'd also like to thank the panellists for making time to be he here. I am honoured to be here with the panellists to hear the conversation on social and wellbeing. We hope that by listening, you will be uplifted. We are currently going through issues that may affect us in different ways. We need to pause for a moment, take time out and care for ourselves as we continue to go forward in life and in this um, different era that we're all going through. We will be taking questions which will be passed on to the panelists and we'd like the questions to be only on the subject we are talking about social and well-being during the COVID-19 lockdown and the re-emergence of Black Lives Matter. I'd like to introduce each of the panellists to you and then they will go further into conversation about who they are and what they're doing. Dina Salo, who works with the World Health Organization. Dina worked in the Ebola response team in Sierra Leone and is now working in Malaysia and Papua New Guinea mm. with a coronavirus. Tanya Hovenen is a practic practicing clinical sociologist and works with inter intergenerational trauma. Ta uh, Tanya is currently doing telephone counselling with EAS for the Northern Territory. Hannah Taylor is the National Project Man Manager for 1800 Respect, which is a 24-hour helpline to support people impacted by sexual assault domestic or family violence and abuse. Fiona Peterson is the CEO of the Healing Foundation and an Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander organisation supporting the healing of stolen generation survivors, families and communities. We will first start with Dina. Dina, thank you for being here with us on the panel today. If you could tell us about yourself, work experience and working in, a, in the area of a pandemic, as well as how people can cope during this time. Sure, thanks, Sandra. I'm really happy to be here today um, with the other panelists and to have so many people join. Uh, um, I'm Aboriginal and Papua New Guinean. Uh, my people are from Western Victoria and also New Island and PNG. Uh, I grew up in Tamworth and uh, I, I went into uh, to do a Bachelor of Nursing uh, and from there I've been working in public health, mainly around sexual reproductive health, um, particularly um, working around bloodborne viruses, STIs um, and working with young um, Indigenous people in communities. Uh, from there, I kind of moved on into looking more into a research side of things, but I, I, I did a, um, a master's in applied epidemiology, Australian National University. Uh, and from there, that enabled me to, to step out and really move into working in emergencies and outbreaks. So uh, I in 2015 went to Sierra Leone and worked with uh, with the WHO in the Ebola outbreak. Um, I was in Sierra Leone for two and a half years um, based there and so was on during the outbreak doing epidemiological work 
and stayed on to work in the district that I was in to support the, the local health districts to, to put their surveillance systems in place and, and work with their rapid response teams that go out and respond to different uh, emerging diseases or disease alerts that, that come up. Uh, and from there, I moved on to uh, the Western Pacific region, so to the regional office, the WHO regional office in this area. Uh, and I sit with the emergency program here. Um, I've been here for around two and a half years. And that affords me to move around this area and the region and work with different countries and different um, departments of health or ministries of health in this region to support uh, their surveillance systems, their earlier alert warning systems, uh, and to, to work with them on their emergency, um, emergency plans or emergency preparedness plans and do event-based surveillance in the region for, uh, for emerging diseases. So since uh, the end of last year and into January, um, we've been working very hard on COVID uh, in the region and at the moment I'm based in, in Papua New Guinea. So here I'm just working with the Ministry of Health and supporting the surveillance team here to really put in place surveillance testing to detect COVID here and support preparedness for provinces. So. Um, yeah, my, my, my work has enabled me to, to travel all around the world um, and, and work with different communities around the world. And um, I really, I mean, I go back to my, my heritage and really understanding, understanding of working within communities is just something that, that particularly young people can take with them and, and really go anywhere in the world and work with any communities in the world. If you have an understanding um, and a deep understanding of how to communicate in your communities, I mean, it, it works wonders and, and you can take that anywhere with you. So I'll stop there to allow others to, to introduce themselves. We're very happy to be here and be a part of uh, such a special panel. Thank you very much, Dina. Uh, Tanya um, Hovenen, if you'd like to speak next. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so thank you. Thank you for the invitation to be joining this panel and, and providing some information around self-care. It's actually a passion of mine. Um, so I'll go there in a moment. So, yep. So Tanya Hovonen, I was born in Mount Isa on Kalkadoon country, grew up there, but ended up in boarding school as well as part of my um, education journey and studied psychology. Um, USQ was um, undergraduate and then postgraduate through um, James Cook University. And I've spent the last seven years in the Northern Territory um, where I got most of my, I guess, um, psychological work, um, most of my psychological work. Um, um, right now I'm based in um, Townsville, Magnetic Island. Um, I got stuck here um, for family reasons and then Corona hit. So I think it affected people in many different ways with coronavirus and the impacts of we actually can be living on how much access you have to family and friends. Um, Sandra, do I go into talking about self-care as part of the introduction as well? Yes, yep. yes, okay. please do. So I just wanted to talk about, because I've been working as a psychologist now for eight years and I think one of the biggest things is is how we um, are more, I guess, uh, not vulnerable, not using that word. We're probably, uh, we're probably more, yeah, more vulnerable to experience things such as burnout, mm -hmm. um, compassion fatigue and emotional exhaustion as part of the work that we do do because mm -hmm. we give our whole heart and soul to, to the work that we do for all the right reasons. Um, but sometimes we give so much more than what we actually have capacity for. And self-care is not um, something that we all um, practice that well, um, just from my experience. So no, no judging and no pointing fingers. I think this is just all a beautiful reminder to say that we, in the work that we do, if we want sustainability to have this care and provide this care and support for others, mm -hmm. that as part of that, we have to make sure that we're looking after ourselves because we don't want to lose ourselves um, mm -hmm. in the line of work that we do carry out. 
So I just put um, a couple of um, slides together um, to talk about all the elements of self-care because sometimes people think self-care is champagne and bubble baths and it's not. It actually goes quite, it goes much deeper than that. So just bear with me. Oh, did that work? Yeah, did that work? Can you see that? No. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Well, if we haven't seen, we can't see that then. What about that? Yes, you're starting. Yeah. Yes. So you just see my screen, just a mountain? Yes. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Okay. So the aspects to self-care, um, one of the biggest aspects is what you actually do in the workplace or as a profession. Then you've got physical self-care, uh, psychological, emotional, spiritual, and, and our relationships as part of that. So workplace um, self-care, most of us might already be doing some of these things already, um, but it's just good to know that what you actually are doing is part of looking after yourself in the line of whatever you do, if you're at work, if you're at home, if you're caring, um, whatever that may be. So just making sure if you're in the workplace that you're engaging in regular supervision as part of the work that we do, consulting with others, like if we're unsure, so that ambiguity or not being sure about your role or the work that you do do can sometimes bring about stress. And this is all about mitigating stress in our lives. Um, setting up peer groups. I mean, I think this is also part of self-care. This session and being on this panel is also about um, looking after ourselves and taking that time to know what we need to do to be well. Um, having strict boundaries, which is hard, very hard on communities and with families and friends. It's, it's really hard, but if we can have boundaries, that's a good thing. Um, reading professional journals, um, knowledge is power. So um, keeping up to date um, with the latest research that comes out, especially in your fields of work or your expertise and keeping up your professional development. So they're all the aspects to professional um, self-care. Um, physical self-care is anything to do with the body. So um, I'd say the top five would be sleep, um, exercise, diet, not the weight loss body image diet, but the brain and body diet, like the diet that you need to keep yourself well. Like if we're going to be, um, I guess, working or living in this current environment, we've got to make sure that we're well resourced to, to be capable, you know, or to feel strong and well. You know, taking the breaks when we can, walking, um, taking dogs for a walk. If we're sick, we actually take the sick leave um, and take that time out and, and, and rest. Um, you, you know, having that permission and feeling that you actually can take that time off. Um, but I'd say that number one would be um, exercise and um, well, actually most of them, but exercise, sleep and diet are really, really important. Um, you know, we've, we've got beautiful um, wisdom of 60 to 80,000 years. Um, but, you know, this mainstream research actually also backs this up. Um, we know about the gut and the brain connections now. So what, you know, that old saying, we are what we eat, it's actually true. So we need to actually make sure that we're eating the right things to be able to do the things that we need to do. And have that sustainability because everyone that's here, or even on this session now, we're here because we want to be of service or to help others. And to do that, um, we do that when we're coming from a full, a full bucket. There's also psychological um, self-care. So again, um, supervision, you know, reflection, refle you know, reflection journals are really, really important. Um, engaging in hobbies that aren't work related. Sometimes we have hobbies and they end up being at the cafe with um, a bunch of work colleagues, like that's wonderful, but also have um, time and space a a away from that. Um, again, boundaries with emails and phones. And just say, just say we're in really responsible positions um, sometimes I suggest that even if it's a couple of days without having the phone on at night, so you might have to be on call, but making sure that you do have one or two nights free from that. Um, make time for relaxation. That's where the bubble bus might come in and time to engage with um, positive friends and family as part of that. Emotional self-care. We have the right to feel the feelings that we have, particularly in this moment. Um, Aunty Sandra was right. We've got coronavirus. On top of that, we've got the biggest civil rights movement in history happening right now. 
um, with the Black Lives Matter movement. And um, again, um, we're going to be, uh, we'll be feeling all different types of emotions during this time. And we've got the right to feel them. Um, so you've got this, you can safely experience those. Um, it's just that if you're sitting in a, in a low mood for a long time, then, then reach out, absolutely reach out if you need to. Have friendships that are supportive. I don't know about this sport and coffee together. Each um, state and territory are in different stages of lockdown and restrictions. So again, do what you, what you can, um, when you can, according to your state or territory that you live in. Um, we've got spiritual self-care, we're um, cultural people. So um, whatever you need to do to keep yourself spiritually strong. And relationships are really important. So um, making sure that we've got really healthy, supportive relationships. You know, I guess one of the biggest things that has come out of coronavirus is actually we've actually uh, deeply understood how important family and friends are to us during this time and that reaching out to those family and friends um, when you can't see them face to face has been part of this journey. Um, still staying in contact with them and it says here attending special events. I've seen some funerals being held online. It's it's not um, it's not ideal, um, but it, you know being able to show the ways of mourning. Um, and some people have been still having weddings or having or delaying weddings and special celebrations as part of the environment we're in. Um, that arriving to work and leaving on time every day is just about again setting um, setting boundaries. Okay. So again, the other thing, the only last thing I would say is the importance of social connections and social supports. Uh, so important that, um, you know, there are very negative events out in the world and, you know, sometimes beautiful opportunities as well. But for this time with um, Corona and um, Black Lives Matter and feeling what we're feeling, it can be, we can buffer that by having um, really close relationships and supportive friends and family. Again, I um, can't um, thank Aunty Sandra enough for you know moments like these because we can it, this these moments actually allow us to connect um, nationally and internationally um, or with each other. So thank you. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you very thank much, you. Tanya. That was excellent. Um, now we'd like to, I'd like to introduce our next guest, Hannah Taylor. The National Project Man Manager for 1800 Respect. Thank you so much, Annie Sandra. Um, I, I Tanya and um, Diana, that was amazing. Thank you so much for letting us be a part of today and um, Natsuwa and all the work that, that you do. I'd just like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, the Gunnara people, and pay my respects to elders gone before us, those present, and our amazing future leaders that we, we see today. And I hope are online today as well. <clears throat> I'm currently in Adelaide um, due to COVID and I'm from Brisbane. So when you talk about the, the space that of being somewhere you're not normally in, I, I totally I totally hear that. So yeah, I am Hannah Taylor and I'm a proud uh, Miller Road woman from the Bogabilla and Kanamala region, border of New South Wales and Queensland. My father is a proud Gamilaroi man uh, who is a pillar in our community. And my mother is a very, feminist, fierce, amazing woman from England, hence the ginger hair. So thanks, Mum, for that. Um, and so I just wanted to talk about 1800 Respect and, and COVID and what we're seeing in this space at the moment. You know, growing up, we worked a lot with our communities and a lot with people in our space around domestic and family violence. I've had the honour of travelling to England and working over in England and the US as a social worker with human trafficking victims and in the space of domestic and family violence with First Nations people. And it was there that I saw that our people consistently need a voice, not only here in our land, but in other lands across the world. And that's where I'm very passionate about, about ensuring that our voices are heard in organisations like 1800 Respect. I'm not sure if everybody knows, 1800 Respect is the National Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault Telephone Counselling and Web Chat Service. We're available 24 hours a day, seven days a week for information referral and counselling. The great aspect about our counsellors is they're, especially during the time of COVID, is that they are trained and skilled to answer calls and contacts from people who are in the same house as someone using violence 
so they can respond and provide that information, referral and counselling even in those, those times as well. Over the last couple of years with 1800 Respect, I've spent my time in a lot of communities across Australia hearing the voices of people with disabilities and our people around how we can make 1800 Respect more accessible. And we've implemented a lot of those recommendations and we're now embarking on new projects to make our service more culturally safe for our people as well. We want to ensure that our communities are being heard and supported in the space of domestic and family violence and sexual assault. And I, I guess I wanted to touch on the aspect of COVID as our numbers have increased a lot and, and ghastly from the, the COVID epidemic that we're seeing, pandemic, sorry, epidemic, different words for this. Um, one of the biggest issues that we've seen in our communities due to COVID is isolation. And as we know, isolation is a, is a very big risk factor for anyone in domestic and family violence or sexual assault. We've seen that in a matter of hours and days notice, COVID has, COVID has caused isolation at an alarming rate. For our callers, home is not the safest place. Mix that in with children, mix that in with kids not being able to go to school, as well as job losses and the anxiety of COVID, we see our numbers increasing. And most of those numbers have increased also via web chat as people cannot access phones anymore as it's not safe to do so. Not only have we seen COVID isolate, the very nature of COVID, especially for our communities, similar to what you said, Tanya, it causes displacement at, again, an alarming rate. Displacement and dispossession from our land, from our community, from our routine and our everyday lives. And as a community in Amazing Culture, we've seen this displacement before and the impacts of this. My father tells me stories of his father being a part of the stolen generation and the displacement is seen in the intergenerational trauma we all know too well, unfortunately. COVID tells us, surprisingly, who we can and cannot see, what we can and cannot do, and where we can and cannot go. And for our people, that sense of disconnect from community and from culture and from everything that creates our normal lives has been felt very deeply. I've consulted with a lot of our community on the ground and my community back in Brisbane, and that disconnect has been seen a lot in our mental health, in people reaching out to services like 1800 Respect, like Beyond Blue, and like Lifeline. And so in terms of the self-care, one of the amazing ways that we can continue to do this during a time of anxiety, isolation, and displacement is to connect. Voicing and echoing what Tanya mentioned about self-care, we are a connected people, and so we need to be connected to ourselves, to others, to the earth, and to the spiritual beings around us. We need to ensure that COVID doesn't displace and take away that sense of connection, however that may look. And so it's really important that people connect to 1800 Respect during this time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so that we we don't lose ourselves in our identity during this time and we, we stay connected. So thank you so much again for letting me be a part of this amazing panel and the amazing experience. I've really, really enjoyed it. You're on mute, Sandra, Annie. Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, and the next person I'd like to introduce is Fiona Pearson from the CEO of the Healing Foundation. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you, and thanks fellow panellists. <laughs> um, going last, I, I probably uh, can just say ditto. <laughs> it's very comforting, <laughs> but um, it's okay. I think it reinforces a really good message. So um, I, yeah, just grateful to be invited here and um, to be on a panel with um, people like Hannah, Tanya and Dina. It's really lovely and, um, just to be um, invited by Natsiwa, who are a really important organisation. Um, really grateful for the work that you do, um, Annie Sandra, and, and your colleagues across Australia. So yeah, I'm Fiona Peterson. I'm a, I'm a Wutati woman um, and, and traditional owner with family roots also in the Torres Strait. Um, so uh, Wutati country is Shelburne Bay in the far northeast Cape where the Rainforest meets the white sand, which meets the um, Great Barrier Reef. So I'm um, very lucky to, um, to um, have that country. Um, 
I want to acknowledge um, traditional owners of the lands on which we're meeting today and I'm grateful to be on Ngunnawal and Lambri today and um, I, I pay my respects to the elders past and present. Um, I am feeling quite honoured to be heading up the Healing Foundation. It, it's a national organisation that partners with communities to address the ongoing trauma caused by actions like forced removal of children from families. We work with communities to create a, a place of safety and providing a, an environment for stolen generation survivors and their descendants to speak for themselves and tell their own stories and be in charge of their own healing. Um, so we, we um, you know, healing is, is quite a broad term and um, it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But um, what, what we're doing is we're healing trauma and we consider it to be essential because it refers to the recovery of the psychological and physical impacts of trauma, which is largely the result of colonisation and past government policies for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So, um, and in doing this, we're tackling some of the source, some of the uh, source of some of the toughest social and health issues, social and health issues that we um, continue to work on. Um, so, um, we we've commissioned some studies, and we know that there are about um, over seventeen thousand stolen generation survivors, and about one hundred and sixty thousand descendants, and. Together, they make up more than a third of the adult Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population. But importantly, this does not account for the families, family members left behind when, when those generations were removed and the communities that lost their children. Um, so in response to COVID-19, you know, we had, we had an announcement of funding, 1.1 billion of a safety net boost for mainstream mental health, telehealth, domestic violence and emergency release, uh, relief, and that was welcomed. Minister Wyatt announced 123 million in addition to support businesses and communities, um, our businesses and communities. But our evidence indicated that the investment uh, largely missed stolen generation survivors and our peoples who experience intergenerational trauma. So our priority has been to ensure services provided by stolen gens, stolen generations organisations remain responsive to the needs of survivors and their descendants, and particularly as uh, restrictions and isolation, which has already been mentioned, exacerbate our barriers to service access, and they set back activities for healing. Um, so, and, and you know, additional hurt and pain was caused with restrictions put on grieving processes after the passing of a family member, which you've already heard um, already. And when border close, when borders close, um, that meant the separation of families as well. So, also through that uh, work we commissioned with the AIHW, it was confirmed with evidence and research that survivors and their descendants report high levels of fear and anxiety about losing control over their lives. There's mistrust and um, a lack of awareness of mainstream services that are also, that they are also entitled to. Um, and already socially isolated, they have high levels of social health, health and economic um, uh, disadvantage. And that's in comparison to other members of the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander population. So um, we are proud of the breadth and wealth of wisdom and skill in community controlled organisations to respond quickly to protecting communities. The setback to healing, however, was a tougher ask as we find it stretches services even in the non-pandemic status quo. So we sought as quickly as possible to redirect and gain additional investment for new funds to provide communities with straightforward and clear advice to help manage trauma and to boost the capacity of stolen generations organisations and other services to support those most at risk. Uh, what we know is that individuals and families fared better when they could stay connected, <laughs> which you've heard here from Tanya and Hannah already, when they stay connected and they um, did this um, usually with devices and phones <laughs> where, where possible and giving um, some of the younger generations a, um, a, 
an added responsibility of making those um, usable uh, and user friendly too, which they're all very good at. <laughs> um, uh, debriefing with someone you trust is one way to minimise anxiousness and worry. Uh, sleeping well, which you've heard from Tanya already, is essential for stress management also. And debriefing also helps the mind to process thoughts that if not processed might keep you from sleeping. Um, some of the activities funded including packaging and sending resources and essential groceries and protective items to community members because we know eating well is important for well-being, as you've heard. Um, time with loved ones, uh, especially, uh, you know, acknowledging that you could only do that in your own family. Um, and um, taking in nature and fresh air, uh, you know, simple ways to increase and maintain well-being. Um, some put bare feet on grass or on sand and in water. Uh, and these are things most could do at home or close by while keeping safe. Uh, and these are probably some of the things that we found we, we take for granted and we probably don't make time for um, in, in the status quo, but I hope, um, we're seeing that it's important that we do, um, especially people working um, in service delivery roles, take that time, make that time, schedule it, to, to do those things that keep our, keep our um, well-being maintained. Um, and importantly, um, one of the messages I wanted to bring today was that um, this was yet another instance of, of, of Western trauma or stress management practice having its perhaps unknown roots in our cultural ways. And um, so we, you know, we debrief with each other all the time over good food and in nature. You know, and it took communities by surprise that it's the simple things we can do, and in many cases have always done, to get through tough times together. Yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Hannah. Um, Dina would just like to add a few more words on. So, Dina, if you'd like, we'd go back to you to add on a few uh, what you'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to touch on the social emotional well-being side of things for my area of work. And I think um, in my line of work that I'm in, I'm often working in places that are remote, they're isolated, um, sometimes they're unstable, um, sometimes there's conflict there. And these are places that are used to quarantine, they're used to uh, lockdowns. Um, and in that position and spending long periods of time in those areas of isolation, there's a few things that I've done in my line of work, which, which I really rely on heavily. And that's one is having a buddy system and that's really having that, that one person, whether it's there in that place or outside of that place, who you check in with on a regular basis and you're in contact with and you can, you can share what you're going through because sometimes when you're isolated in places um, that you know, are unstable, it can be very hard. So having that buddy system set up is really important um, and also knowing yourself I think is a really important place to be and understanding uh, the place that you're in. So for me, I, I, I work long, long hours for, um, for long periods of time where you're constantly working on adrenaline, really. And there's times where you come to where you need to know where, you know, what type of relaxation you need and it's determining what type of relaxation that actually is. Like, is that actual sleep that I need now? Is that, do I need to get some paints and pull them out and do something creative to get my mind off something? Um, is it spiritual um, that I need? Um, or is it movement? Do I need to get out and exercise and just run, run and just, okay, and then come back? Or do I need to put on a, a YouTube on Pilates or something like that to, to get through this? So I think they're things that I rely on heavily when I'm just, when I'm working in isolation a lot. And that's just 
like just sitting back and then working out to myself like what is it actually do I need at this point in time to get through this short period where I'm at at the moment. Thank you Gina. Thank you. I have a question um, from someone and the and feel free to answer it anyone or if you'd like to all have a go at answering Social media is not a nice or kind place at the moment with all of the anti-Black Lives Matters posts and support of the far-right conservatives. How can we protect our young from this harm and emotional torment? Okay, I might answer that one. So, um, and invite the fellow panelists to answer as well. Um, I would be saying having, um, I think there's some national conversations about some of the social media's um, platforms being held accountable. So I know there's conversations at that level, I'm not too privy to that. But while that's happening, I think having um, limits or safe places and monitoring um, the, the access of young people. Um, when we say young, I'm not too sure how young these young people are, but having, um, I guess, um, some ways to, to probably limit access. Um, and on the back of that, while there's um, those negative comments, there's also some beautiful positive areas or platforms or spaces that young people can go, um, along with adults. I mean, goodness, what I've seen on social media has been quite um, disgraceful, um, racist and discriminatory. And I think, um, I think for all of us, even for our young people, having some boundaries of access. Yes, thank you. Would anybody else like to, to answer? Okay. Oh, Sandra, uh, sorry, it's Fiona here. I was just, um, just going to say that um, just encouraging those discussions with our young people and making it safe to have them is, is it goes a long way um, with, and it's, it's, um, cause in those discussions, you can give that perspective that social media is up here, but you're living down here or you're living here with me in my house. And, you know, we or uh, in our community and with our families and, um, uh, it's, it's just, I guess, and that's grounding. Um, whereas a lot of the stuff happening up here or out there, um, it, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, people, you know, keep hiding behind screens basically and, and being non-regulated, whereas, um, which is completely different to the way we're living our lives and our families and our communities. So it's, um, and, and that's, that matters more, I guess, than, than what's happening out there. And it's hard because not all people see it that way. But for our um, young people in particular, I think one of those um, protective factors is just having those discussions about what's real and what views are important to pay attention to and what aren't. And usually it's the views of our old people and the views of um, our people uh, who are trusted and keep us safe that matter more than what's happening in the social media lens. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. That was excellent but from both years. I'd like to uh, ask this one to Dina first, if she could answer it, because you've worked in so many different communities. Um, <clears throat> given that women often carry the emotional burdens of care in families and communities, how can they best be supported to sustain themselves? So you would have seen this when you worked in F West Africa, you're working in Asia. So if you can give us an idea on, on, on that, thank you. Take your mute off. Yes, I'm unmuted now. Um, so look, the, the areas that I've worked in, I've, I've worked in um, patriarchal societies and matriarchal societies. And there's really a difference, but also in both of those societies, women are very strong. They're very strong and they're at the core of the families. And uh, in the 
outbreaks that I've been in, particularly for uh, for uh, for the community engagement and actually working in with the community is really understanding what the issues are at the core of the community so we can respond better in communities. It's really about linking in with those different parts of the community that we really need to understand to, to get the right response in. And a lot of the time, that's for us looking at where women fit within that society because they're all often at the core of it. And so for, in terms of looking after themselves in, in this time, I think it's actually in the area of outbreaks and when we're thinking about people being quarantined and being isolation, in isolation, it's about looking at what their core functions within the society are and really working in and with those communities and with women to really bring them up and to allow them to carry the right messages that need to be carried. Because for us, I mean, for, for us when we're responding, those messages coming from the right people, which is a lot of the time the mothers in those communities, to the community, to the children, and, and through to the leaders in the community, are really, really the, the it's really at the core of what we're, we're trying to do. So in terms of self-care for those people in those positions, a lot of the time you see strong women in communities, they're worried about everyone else in the community and they wanna really drive home these strong messages, but they're not necessarily looking after themselves. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. can see that they're very tired, they're very run down and they have a lot on their shoulders. And I think it comes back to, to actually stepping back and, and looking at it, you can't feed someone before you feed yourself. And I think it's really important to have, you know, to pull back sometimes and just feed yourself, whether that's um, emotionally, spiritually, um, connecting with family and friends and really stepping back and then coming back out. I, I find when I step back for a little bit, even if it's just like a couple of hours in the day, or even if it's a day that I want to take out, I come back, I have a clearer mind, I have a, a fresher outlook on what needs to be done next. And I think that's something that we have to allow our women to do. We have to allow them that time to pull back and then come back out and shine. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I've got another question. Can you mention compassion fatigue earlier, which I really re resonate with? What other hidden signs do you recognise in yourself that might exist under the radar for others to be aware of? So, you know, if you want to all give a quick and respond to that, that'll be great. Because we've got another two questions after this. Thanks. Okay. So, <clears throat> compassion fatigue is when we give so much compassion passion um, that we actually are exhausted um, we've got no compassion left and it, I'll, I'll probably have a better way of explaining it it's like when we give so much heart and love that we haven't got left much left for ourselves and um, some of the symptoms of that is um, you know difficulty sleeping um, feeling irritable like um, uh, fatigue, um, not eating well, and starting to not feel numb and not wanting to engage in all of the things that we normally like to engage with. Um, and I guess I call it a slippery slope. It doesn't, it, it's just a little bit step by step. And, but once we're there, it can take a little bit to come back from. So, so hearing from um, Dina just then about um, you know, knowing yourself is really, really important and knowing and feeling that within your body, you know, those little warning signs such as, you know, not, not being able to sleep and, and not eating and probably um, using um, unhelpful coping strategies. Um, you know, we might be turning to alcohol or um, other behaviours that are probably not so health, healthy and helpful. Um, I'll leave it for the other panellists to answer. Um, sorry, I've got so many questions. Can I just go on to a couple of them? Sorry, and then you can each, you know, if you just want to work out who wants to answer what. 
One of the questions is, panelists, can you address the Black Lives Matter issue? So does anyone want to just quickly quit, speak, uh, speak about that? For example, you know, with the Black Lives Matters issue and with the coronavirus and, and everything, what's been happening is that I think, you know, that a lot of people are feeling, I don't know, it's different days. We've got so much on top of us at the moment. So, you know, and now with the coronavirus and now the Black Lives Matter issue. So what? how do you think with the Black Lives Matters issue with everything going on, how, how does that reflect across everything? on top of everything. I can I can start that conversation. And one thing that we've noticed from a 1-800 respect perspective is our call volumes have increased during the Black Lives Matter campaign. As an Aboriginal woman, COVID has a broader cluster, as I spoke about before, about displacement and dispossession. And then we add this Black Lives Matter um, civil rights movements, which has all of a sudden the rest of the world questioning our identity. And so it's, it's, it's a hard space. And I know that there's been um, a lot of my community that have really felt de deeply about it and feel discombobulated almost. I know the way of describing it. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing space to be able to speak up because there, during this time, especially in Australia, it feels like to me the rest of the world is finally listening to what we've been saying and what our trailblazers and our aunties and those gone before us and our uncles have been saying for a very long time. And it's almost like COVID, Black Lives Matter, mixes us to be almost sometimes confused about what we're, we're, we're fighting for and what we're pushing towards. And so I have no answers, sorry, um, but I, I remind us during this time to remember the trailblazers gone before us and sing the praises of the amazing women, like, you know, for example, on this panel and look at the amazing people that are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, that are amazing black human beings that have done incredible work as well. Because when the world is questioning our identity, we and ourselves need to stay connected and remind ourselves who we are, where we've come from and connect to services to have that yarn and have those those conversations. That's my... Yeah, thank you very much, Hannah. That was excellent. I've got another question here. The challenge managing your own worries and concerns... Oh, no, I'll just sense this one. Sorry, I meant to. I work in a crisis accommodation, safe haven communities that help women and children fleeing DV immediately. We ensure these women and children do not become homeless. We are working in regional communities to encourage First Nation peoples to come forward to support. How can we engage with them more to ensure they know we can help them with crisis accommodation rather than stay in an abusive relationship? Um, oh, it's Fiona, you know? Um. Oh, no, Hannah, you're probably the best place to take this one. But I think what I want to say is, um, because I already said it in my opening, is that um, there's, there, there could possibly be a mistrust there or a lack of awareness of of what um, that family or that person is entitled to or, or, or could be supported by. So um, working out the best way of reaching that family with uh, good communications about your services and what, um, and building that trust and relationship and rapport would go a long way in <laughs> making sure, uh, um, ensuring engagement, yeah. Mm. Sorry, Hannah. Sorry, thank you. Um, I, I totally agree and to echo that, I just wanted to add that um, one of the great aspects of 1-800 Respect is that it's completely confidential and anonymous, um, unless there's a risk to harm yourself or somebody else. The, the great aspect of that is people don't even have to give their name. And we've noticed that as we build trust with our communities, um, our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities between 1-800 Respect, that is something that has gone out that people can um, connect with 
is the fact that they can call up and not give their name. And a lot of our calls are from people that are first disclosing what's happening or what kind of relationship they're in or just gathering information. So if your service may not be the first point of call as it is an amazing refuge and an honour the work that you do, they can connect to something, another service like 1-800 that is available to have that conversation and they can call back as many times as they, they need to to work through what's happening and then we can connect them all, all obviously to the state-based service and, and hopefully to yours as well. Okay, thank you. I've got another question. Thank you for a wonderful insight. I have the following questions to ask anyone on the panel. Given the reliance of online mode of delivery during COVID, could the panel share their experience of overcoming challenges of reaching communities who are not digitally connected? And a follow-up question is whether online service delivery structured place during COVID can be levered to a improve health promotion and narrow health gaps in Indigenous communities. So, yep. Yep, so um, just Tanya here, just um, in, the, in the Northern Church, we've been doing phone, um, this is just, there's all different elements to that, like service delivery or is it mental health treatment or is it health treatment, but I can only speak from the perspective of providing telephone counselling. It is very different from face-to-face counselling. Will I say that we should be using it going forward? Probably not as an, the only option, but as an option, absolutely yes, because um, we, we used it pre-COVID-19 um, to reach remote communities already. Um, so phone, um, Skype and Zoom. Um, and yet there are some communities that it won't reach, but there's still a, a high level of communities that it will reach. But there are some provisions, I think, um, I think um, Hannah talked about it earlier, um, there's difficulties in having a safe place to talk and privacy and confidentiality for that person. And um, I guess, um, you know, looking at other ways or platforms of having that access is really, really important. I see it as positive that, that it's another form, but it, I, I, from my perspective, it shouldn't be the only form. We do say at the beginning of the interview, sorry, Annie Sandra, that I can't see you I can't, I can't feel the energy in the room, so I am relying on your voice. So there's lots of different things that we have to do as part of the phone, um, deliver, the phone counselling. Okay. Okay, I have another question. I'm the only Aboriginal person in my research institute and feel like I'm the only person in this workplace that feeling affected by the COVID-19 and Black Lives Matter on top of work duties. Do you have any general advice on how to navigate non-Indigenous uh, environments? Do any of you want to answer that? Um, I can answer some of that. I can start. Um, I, I guess in the environments that I work at, um, often the only Indigenous and or only woman um, at a table. And actually, it, it comes back to who you are, knowing yourself as a person and, and having that strength within you and understanding that you, you actually do have a space at the table and, and you do deserve that space at the table and you bring with yourself lots of experience um, and that your opinion does matter. Um, and what you have to say, you carry a lot of experience behind that, but also you have, I mean, being the only indigenous person at a table, you, you have different life experiences that you carry with you that a lot of people around the world actually understand and so when you're coming to that table, you're actually coming and understanding the perspectives of the communities in the places that you're going to. So, I, I mean, while there's a lot of pressure um, when you're in that position, and I, I've been in research institutes before, and I understand that, you know, I've, I've been in that position where I'm the, the only Indigenous person there in, the, in, in that space. And you know, it's a hard space to be in and you have to find your allies. And I, I've, I've had, had 
had that situation uh, when I've worked in districts and I've been, you know, the only young woman in a district where I'm working with, with uh, mostly men in a health department and I'm sitting at a table and you have to actually assert yourself and you have to be strong in what you're saying. Um, and, you know, these, these are the things that you have to carry with you and, and yes, you know, that can be difficult at times. But I, I think it's if you think about where you're coming from and the history and the experience that you have behind you, um, it actually carries a lot of weight. Yeah, thanks. That's excellent. Yes, and I know that you would have, it would have been very difficult for you. But I've known you for ages, Dina, and I, I, I can tell you your strength and your expertise and your knowledge but it's also your attitude has just really, you know, it's excellent and it's really good to have that great attitude you have because, you know, the work that you do do and the, the extreme pressure that you're under working long hours in so many different countries, you know, you, 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 and being the only Indigenous person, only woman in person, at times it can be very difficult. So thank you for that. I've got another question. There's a lot of talk about the pandemic providing an opportunity for all of us to really re-evaluate our lives and build back better based on the lessons learned during lockdown. What lessons do you hope people will have learned when this is over and how can you see, how would you like to see society change as a result? So if you'd all like to have a go at that, that'll be excellent, thanks. Oh, I'll start. It's probably my turn. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I think it's what I alluded to in my opening remarks as well. Um, I think, um, you know, in some of the networks I've had discussions um, in, it's, it's about um, um, recognising the strengths and the elements of our, our cultures and the way we are that keep us safe and well and not taking that for granted anymore and um, um, tapping into that um, more often than we probably do in the status quo. So I, I hope uh, that's one insight I think that I hope will be um, taken into a return to post pandemic. Um, but I, um, and I think too, many of us don't live where we're from. We've, we've taken on roles that are a national or, or we're away from home. And um, I think uh, just, it's highlighted to me just how important it is to um, maintain those relationships with people, with people you care about, with people that um, you draw strength from. Um, the people who who support you, who have supported you, you to get to where you are, and um, making that time, scheduling that time to call and connect. Um, uh, that was tricky, tricky for me, because I I had annual camping holidays off the grid with my family, you know, and that that's what recharged me to take on, you know, the follow the next year or the next six months until Christmas or, you know, so. Um, not having that meant that I had to find new ways to um, make sure uh, I made time and space for, for those conversations I would normally have, like around a campfire or while crabbing or whatever. So um, uh, I'm, um, I'm, I'm just going to make sure I honour that and, and show how grateful I am that, that it's a part of who I am when I, when I do this work, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Our hour is nearly up um, and we do have a couple of other questions and I might actually, uh, hopefully we can actually do this again with the four of you and, you know, do, do another session. I think that it's really been excellent. Again, the four of you, I'm just truly, truly honoured as an Indigenous elder in this world to have the four of you come on here and have a conversation as the young leaders in this world. It's just a real pleasure to have you all because, you know, your experience, your wisdom, and, you know, you've overcome so many challenges yourself, the whole four of you. It's just, you know, it's very empowering. It's empowering for me. And I know, you know, with the 
all of the reading from our, uh, what the chat session has said, it's empowering to other people. And this is why, you know, I felt that this was really important to have this webinar so that we can, you know, your wisdom that you use for have your experiences and, you know, your voices can help uplift, you know, women, children and other people who are listening on this, on this webinar, you know, and, and, it, it, and it has, you know, from the conversations that I've seen, you know, your whole wisdom and experience um, has been uplifting for everybody on this webinar. Again, I'd really like to thank the four of you uh, for taking the time out um, to be here and to support the webinar, to support Natsua and to support the University of Queensland and to support all those people who are on the panel. This, uh, this will also be recorded and I'm more than happy to share it with all of you. But again, um, you know, everybody's saying thank you, Titters. These conversations are <laughs> important. And, you know, thanks for this. It's really powerful and warm. And this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much to all of you. Thank you, ladies. I needed this. Thank you, guys, for such a pr wonderful presentation. Thank you all so much. Excellent, rich conversations. Thank you for sharing your experience, Dina. I admire your strength. You know, it goes on and on. So, you know, again, I'm very truly humbled to be here as a moderator uh, with the four of you. Thank you all very much. <laughs>